you, you, you are now listening to the project. To the project. To the project. Where we stop at nothing to bring you the right facts on health, fitness, and psychology. Featuring some of the world's most experienced professional professionals. So you can learn, lift, and live with your hosts, Meg, Dr. D, and Mandy. DJ is definitely not getting the social interaction that he needs as a six year old. And he's missing out on that foundational piece. And I think that's the most important piece of education in school is having peers, learning from others in sports is a big part of that too. The notion of active listening, it requires, I think, a presence. And conversations are not just simply verbal, they're also nonverbal. And so, you know, your being or your presence is an important part of the conversation or the dialogue or the discussion, and it's missing. You know, we really need to start addressing and recognizing that this anxiety is real for a lot of people. They don't know if they're safe still, even when they are vaccinated. Is this going to come back? Is this not going to back? Because we've all been traumatized. This is a trauma. All this and more in today's episode. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of The Project. Psyched with Dr. D, expats abroad. Uh, really, we're just meshing a lot of it together today with a great guest that is joining us who has been in Kuwait for, I don't know, Dr. Rolda, you've probably been here for a long time, ever since AUK opened, or as far as I can remember. Dr. Rolda, she's the president of AUK. She was my teacher for, I think, three or four different classes over the last uh, few years of my AUK career. And Dr. Rolda, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be with you. And it's great to actually see you after such a long time. And it's great actually to be with one of my colleagues, Dr. Dinka, <laughs> on the particular program. So thanks a lot for the invitation. And I was giving you a compliment. I was saying, look how handsome he is now. And he's he's matured and he's married. <laughs> I was saying all these good things. <laughs> I was one of the biggest troublemakers at AUK for, for a brief <laughs> period of time. But Dr. Ronaldo, I actually have to thank you. You gave me a word that I have used for the past, I don't know, 10 years, which is othering. I took a class with you, and um, it was a class that was based on othering people of other nationalities and people of other, you know, other backgrounds. And it is a word that has always stuck with me in interviews, you know, everything, everything. I've always used that one word, and it is so important in my vocabulary, to be honest with you. So thank you. So you're very welcome, but I'm really intrigued. How do you use that particular term? Because that term and that definition has changed over time substantially, hasn't it? I can imagine. I mean, I always use it where when I'm describing myself at times and I'll say, you know, people other me because I am of an Arab nation. I'm, you know, the Kuwaitis will other me out because I'm half American and the Americans will other me out because I'm half Kuwaiti. So I never really fit in. Dr. Lola, much like you also, correct? You're from, you've got two different backgrounds too. That's correct. Um, I am German and German Arab. So, you know, we walk in the same moccasins or in the same shoes. And, you know, these kind of, you know, I was a product of a mixed marriage back in the 1960s where these things were not as common as they are today. And so you are with one foot in a culture and with one foot out of a culture and you sort of nowhere and everywhere. And this does create certain identity issues uh, as you grow up. But I've learned or, you know, by experience or through experience that that space in between can actually be very empowering. And it prevents people from sort of uh, trying to figure you out because you cannot be figured out because you are more or less an international. And that's a good space to be. And it's quite an interesting space to operate from within. So Yes, but it takes a considerable you know, number of years and it takes experience to make it work for oneself. And each person goes through different sort of changes and experiences. But in the end of it, at the end of it, it actually works out pretty well. Yes. And I think, uh, you know, I think even here in Kuwait, where you, you know, with our students or even with clients I work with, it's like, they are expats, but they were born and raised here and all their life lived here. And they even speak the you know, the Kuwaiti accent. And when they speak to you, you really think that they're Kuwaiti. And then you find out, no, you know, they're either, you know, Jordanian, Palestinian, Iraqis, whatever. And the idea is that they never know where they fit because technically this is their country, right? This is where they were born and they were raised and this is the culture and they've gone to school here. 
and they feel like they're totally fit, but then they're not, you know, they're not nationals and they don't have the, they don't have the passport to go along with it. So, you, you know, a lot of times with people I see, there's a little struggle with where do I fit? Like they can't go back home, especially nowadays with this COVID and a lot of changes in our policies. Like today I was having a talk with my daughter and she's like, well, you know, somebody asked her what you was raised in in the U S and I'm like, well, but you were also raised in in the U S she's like, no mom, I wasn't, I was born here. I was raised here. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. Like I totally forget where automatically we say we're Americans. And she's like, no. So the idea is that she also is trying to, I mean, she's only 11 and she's trying to think like, okay, I never want to leave here. This is where I was raised. You know, but I'm also, yeah. I know that I'm American and it's like when you're a kid and trying to maneuver, it's such a challenge, I think, but for you even more, because you were raised in Germany, right? Well, actually I was raised in a considerable number of countries. Uh, I so I was born in Germany. I was raised in part in Germany. I went to boarding school in Jerusalem, then went to boarding school in England and then left after graduation or pretty much after the second year of my university experience in England to the United States. So you know, for me, the, the whole notion of nationality is it's rather fluid and um, you identify yourself a person of the world rather than a person of one particular place. So there are no geographic restrictions. I think that the you get used to sort of the nuances of different cultures and different ways of thinking. And you begin to sort of maneuver through these cultures in very interesting ways. In my experience, you become more a diplomat than anything else uh, yeah. because you start to tap into the various cultural sensitivities of, of people and the way in which they were raised and what the cultural expectations are. So uh, again, you know, you don't particularly see part of it, but you understand it. And I think understanding it uh, is actually quite, can actually be very useful uh, in more ways than one. And then, you know, the, the whole question in terms of where is home, all right? and yeah. at, Certain points uh, within certain political frameworks, we feel that the world is sort of you know, drifting apart and, and there is this level of nationalism that sort of rises. But then you, at, at other points in history, you sort of feel that the world is coming, you know, getting smaller. But um, yeah, I, I totally understand that. And I think children have a very hard time dealing with this. But as long as they understand that ultimately we're all human beings uh, and that that matters, irrespective of what your background is. But yes, I totally understand it. And I understand also these sort of identity conflicts and struggles that we go through. And I think it's never ending. Uh, it, it doesn't matter how hard you try. But the harder you try, the, the more complicated it becomes. So you just sort of take it one step at a time and you sort of live along. Or, I mean, maybe it's not a problem to say that, you know, sometimes yeah. like when I'm talking to my friends in the U.S., I'm like, well, you Americans are this, you American. And my friend the other day is like, well, you're an American. And it's somehow, like I said, being here for 16 years, I no longer, you know, say, I'm American. I'll say, you guys do this. You guys do that. Like whenever they're saying, when you're coming back, I'm like, I'm not sure. Can I really manage? I'm 16 years of living here. So will yes. I fit guys? Are you not one of us? Yeah. And I didn't know what to say. Under the COVID crisis, though, you know, people uh, with this sort of scattering of families all around the world, it's, it sort of created a level of fear because the ease of transportation was not available and uh, people became concerned. And again, these sort of existential questions were raised. Yes, uh, okay, I work here. I have my friends here, yet my parents are over here, you know, in another part of the world. So you know, where do I go and where do I need to be within a pandemic that is restricting my travel and that limits our movement and I think not also a crisis, a sort of personal crisis. I think that you, Dr. Juliet, would be able to sort of expound on the psychology of this, but we are certainly feeling the sort of emotional weight that people carry in terms of, you know, what kind of decisions they want to make because they are no long-term decisions. They're just one day at a time. So that is, I think, how people are maneuvering through this sort of the wait and see game in terms of what, what is going to happen next. So, Dr. Rolda, I mean, you acted as an inspiration for me and a lot of other students, including my wife, Haya, you know, growing up with uh, someone as influential as you and Dr. Dinka, you know, a lot of professors at the American University of Kuwait, so many I can't name, but in particular you, I've taken so many classes with you, I think four, if I'm not mistaken. And 
I mean, listening to your background and everything and being a strong, powerful woman and rising through the ranks, how difficult was that from the geographical perspective that you're talking about of not really having those roots geographically and, you know, being othered, A, because you're a woman, you know, in our current society, especially in Kuwait and in the Middle East and the cultural issues. How was that fight and struggle to get where you are today? I mean, it's really an inspirational story. Well, I can't quite define it as a struggle in as much as it was, it just happened. From a very young age, my parents chose boarding school school for girls. Experiences are very different than living with your family. So, you know, you are forced pretty much to be independent and you're forced to socialize with individuals that that typically you don't socialize with, you know, over the entirety of a year or uh, over the entirety of weeks and months and live together. And so, you know, being separated from my family for a considerable number of years, actually from the age of eight, and that boarding school experience, whether it was in Jerusalem or in the United Kingdom, gave me a sense of independence and forced me to engage with with my peers and with teachers and caregivers in very unique ways. And so, you know, that certainly taught me a sense of resilience, uh, I suppose, and I think also gave was a source of strength. I then, you know, decided to get married and raise a family and pursue my post-secondary education. So I've been pretty independent. For, I've been pretty independent throughout my life. And I had an exceptional supportive family, um, both my husband and my children were very supportive of that. And um, in 2004, you know, I decided or we decided to come to Kuwait. Uh, And again, that was uh, more an accident in that uh, I saw an ad in the Chronicle of Higher Education at that time, the American University of Kuwait. So we came to Kuwait and um, I was received by an exceptionally strong startup team who, again, had uh, similar viewpoints and a similar mission. And the founders had a very deliberate mission in terms of what this university was supposed to be about in a sense that they wanted to build it on a broad context of knowledge with and giving students transferable skills based on, you know, accountability, responsibility, a sense of value, a stronger sense of self. You know, it's just exciting to be part of that kind of initiative. And, you know, the rest is history. We, you know, I came in as a professor. I was a member of the startup team. For me, that gave me a strong sense of purpose. And when individual has a strong sense of purpose, is exceptionally passionate about what, what one does, you, know, you can't falter much. Um, you just simply pursue it. Go into a teaching and learning environment where, as a matter of fact, I, as a professor, learned more than I taught. And I think that these are the kind of interesting journeys that we go through from which we take a lot. And then I went into administration and I never felt, I think, you know, you talked about, you know, it must have been very challenging for you as a woman. I never thought about it. I had my goal set in terms of contributing to the institution, uh, being a good colleague, contributing to the broader mission of the institution. And uh, I couldn't go wrong with that. And it led me to, you know, to various positions and then, you know, to, you know, occupy the position of president of the American University of Kuwait. But it's not so much the positions in as much as it's the colleagues that I have worked with and the strength of the institution or the strength of one individual is the strength of many. And the strength of many is, you know, is the strength of one individual. So we as an institution in UK, and you know you are a KAUK graduate. You are you know that we are a smaller community. You know we we reach out to each other and we help each other and we support each other. And that's also at the level of administration. We have a very strong administration of many women in leadership positions. It is highly diverse, and that diversity was never questioned ever at that institution. And so our strength lies within our diver- diversity on every level whether it's a you know a women a gen- whether it uh, you know touches upon gender or whether you know we have uh, lots of people lots of faculty and stuff from different ethnic backgrounds representing nations and uh, and that is what makes us strong i'm always fascinated with this idea of resiliency right i teach my student about it i teach my clients i feel like it's something that really 
differentiates people that can tap into it. We all have it, but I think some yeah. people tap into it and other people don't. Maybe because you were in boarding and maybe because you became independent at a young age and maybe because you're so focused and you know what you want, but you know you're resilient. And so that takes me to the next question. It's because of your resilience. As soon as you took presidency, COVID hit. One of the things, you know, I happened to be just before, you know, last February, I, I took a leave and uh, pretty much the next day I received the call from our board that things don't look very well. They had the first three cases here in, in Kuwait and, you know, they immediately that became a concern and I came back to Kuwait and, you know, we gathered, the senior team gathered and and we couldn't quite figure out where this was all going to go. There was, you know, the first communication was that, you know, we are going to, you know, be on an extended two-week holiday, but it just didn't look very good. We was already working on uh, figuring out how to prepare the university and the institution in terms of the learning management platform, which we already had. But how are we going to bring on online the synchronous component of instruction? So they were working very hard. The next step was, how are we going to get our faculty trained? And so, as you were aware, you know, we felt that the best way to do this was through a learning tree. So we put together a team of faculty. And look, I mean, uh, Dr. Juliet, the solutions presented themselves by focusing on the strength of a whole slew of individuals in the institution. Yes? We're right. an exception. So, you know... Our faculty were on board. They were exceptionally helpful. They were exceptionally magnanimous. They helped each other. The training occurred between faculty. It then was also transferred to the Center for Teaching Excellence and organized, but really the faculty held it together. They trained each other. They relied on each other. And the organization in and of itself sort of came together as a community in trying to move the learning operations or the teaching operations online. Of course, it, was, it took a lot yeah. of leaderships. Of course, it, yeah. it was a team. But, but the idea is that here you had to, you have a new role. You're just you know, trying to immerse yourself in all the duties that you have from regular. And then suddenly this thing happened. I mean, in, in regards to like psychology and how we can understand it. Plus, I'm sure you had a lot of faculty who was like, you know, anxious, not, you know, the unpredictability that you mentioned earlier where, yeah. you know, we, we can't think about what's happening next. We couldn't really. We just had to deal with one month at a time yes. because we don't know when we were going to go back. And, but I'm sure you heard a lot of people that were anxious. There were people probably wondering what's happening. And you have to be the person who was holding this institution together. Yes, it is a team, but you definitely, I mean, what do you, how do you deal with your stress? Like, what did you do? In order for you to manage and be able to put steps together, think logically, don't become emotional. What helped you? Actually, you know, tapping into my own emotions, I feared it. Yeah. Mm. So you have to own your fear. You know, ultimately, you know, I'm also a human being. And so uh, fear of not being, the fear of the situation, the fear for your own family, it makes you empathetic to what others are going through. Okay. Mm. And empathy here is exceptionally important when Very you true. lead an institution forward because uh, you, you're going to have to feel what others are feeling in order to be able to bring them on board towards a common goal, All right? So in my particular case, you know, I put everything on the back burner in terms of, you know, having to deal with my own fears and questions and sort of really focus in service of the institution because ultimately when you are leading any kind of organization institution the position of itself requires that first and foremost you are in service of an institution or an organization and your primary responsibility is your family and your family becomes then that institution and the people that work so you provide the same kind of support and problem-solving skills that you would provide for your own, yes? And yeah. so th there is no distinction. So if you can imagine sort of from my vantage point, AUK, the, the length uh, that I've been at AUK, the sense of community that is there, it is my family. So you yeah. take ownership of that, yes? And yes. so you want your family to move forward 
you want your family to be safe. So I think that that is from where I derived my strength uh, and also from my colleagues, obviously, who who all participated in their various different capacities. Yes. Now, also behind the scenes, of course, you're going to have to deal with you know individuals who, who really, some of them were sick, others had lost family members, others were worried. So there are a whole slew of things. But I think that uh, when you start to individualize we have to individualize these interactions. We wanted to make sure that each person was taken care of. Whether or not we did a good job, you know, that remains to be seen. But by and large, it was all hands on deck, whether it was in terms of supporting students or supporting our colleagues or families of colleagues uh, and ensuring that everybody was safe. Everybody had the tools to do what they needed to do and then move forward during very uncertain times. And as you can imagine, you know, the information that was shared with us, uh, the global situation made it uh, tenuous at best. Uh, But I think that as a community, I think we did exceptionally well. And the team spirit, I I mean, I know that there were ups, you know, that there were certain situations where really people started to lose hope. But, But I think by and large, people have gotten used to understanding where we're going what we're doing. Um, We've very quickly put into place resources that people could tap into almost 24 hours around the clock. And then, you know, you you sort of sit back and then you try to think, you know, what has just happened? Uh, Because it seems so surreal and yet it is so real. Yes. And I would have to lie to say that there were not, there were times where, you know, I personally felt you know, a level of exhaustion and almost depression in the sense that, you know, when is this going to end? When can we come back? But I think that we've sort of weathered the storm. Uh, and I think that also that level of vulnerability, you know, that I also share with my colleagues uh, makes us that much more human. We are not superheroes. We, we are also just like anybody else. It's just right. that, you know, we are in a position where we are trying to bring people together to work together. And we did that very well. Dr. Orla, I'm just curious. Before we had started, you said a lot of people are going to have to get used to going back to work also. From a leadership perspective, how are you going to handle that with the employees that are going to face some hardship with going back into the office? Yes, you know, that is a really good question. There were certain terms of whether we wanted to have our staff back onto campus and our faculty pack on campus to teach their courses from their offices. We had ready the offices for teaching to sort of kind of professionalize, take the teaching out from their homes into the offices to provide them also a, a professional space. And I had all the intention of, and we had all the intention of implementing that back in September and October for the full season. You are making a decision, but also One of the things that I've learned throughout this, you you need to be highly flexible as situations change. You cannot just simply stick on a decision that you know is not going to work in the end, just for the sake of, you know, the decision in and of itself. From where people taught, as long as it remained, you know, within a professional context, that was very important and that it did not interfere in the teaching process, in the synchronous teaching process and engagement with students. And so that flexibility worked very well for us taking into consideration that we had faculty and staff who either were, I mean, I can give you a number of things, either taking care of you know, elderly parents and they didn't want to be exposed to the virus because they didn't want to infect the elderly parents. That's number one. People with pre-existing conditions who were worried and that is, you know, these are all exceptionally legitimate concerns. People, and here was the bigger one, Uh, schools were let out, teaching is happening from the home. And so you had parents with small children who needed to be there during schooling to sort of organize their kids at home. They're no longer functioning in the school. So how do you navigate, you know, working parents? How do you navigate through that? While the parents also have their work to do from the home and they can't exactly leave their children to their own devices. And so, you know, I think that, uh, you know, for us, that level of flexibility worked very well, knowing that each each person and each family had their own reasons to make a decision either or uh, in terms of their workspaces without placing any more undue stress 
on already a stressful situation, all right? So that's how we dealt with it over the last year now. As we now are moving, I mean, we're going through the vaccination process. We believe, and I say, uh, you know, within quotation marks that we may be back onto campus in fall. We haven't heard anything and we know that we need to abide by the uh, ministerial mandates in terms of how they guide us through this. Uh, we cannot be just independently making these rules and regulations for ourselves and independently make these decisions, and quite rightly so. But that is a good question. You know, how do you deal with individuals? Let's assume that you know teaching is back. You know, we are going to go into the physical teaching space. How do you how do you deal with individuals who still you know who have pre-existing conditions, who may have not been vaccinated? who have elderly to take care of, so and the small children that may or may not be at home. I am not quite sure. So, you know. I, I was thinking that also not only that they have like, I mean, if they get vaccinated, but it's the idea. I was just reading an article. Uh, there was the, in, in the New York Times where there was this, uh, maybe psychologist wrote it and talked about the post-COVID and where people are really have experiencing a lot of anxiety being in public. You're asking someone that has been in quarantine for a while or staying home where they've minimized their uh, social engagement or interaction with people. And the idea of like now suddenly you're saying to them, okay, now you're going to go and teach your class and your class is like 35 people. You're going back to normal where you're seeing people on a regular basis. And I think that some people are going to be very, very anxious just being in public. And this article was talking about, you know, we really need to start addressing and recognizing that this anxiety is real for a lot of people. They don't know if they're safe still, even when they are vaccinated. Is this going to come back? Is this not going to come back? Because we've all been traumatized. This is a trauma. I've read a similar article and uh, it is concerning. I mean, the post-traumatic stress that people are going to are experiencing are going to be experiencing. It's going, I mean, I... I figure that this would be, it's a long-term thing that people are going to be struggling with. There was one particular article where, you know, they're trying to argue for, okay, post-traumatic stress also give, you know, provides, you know, turn it into post-traumatic opportunities. Yes. Mm. So, you know, as a direct result of that, we need to think about how do we, you know, move forward with the current situation while, taking care of the the very people that provide that services to any organization in our in our case you know, support our student learning so we're dealing with you know our staff and faculty and we're also dealing with our students all right so that the might be experiencing people, trauma that might be experiencing grief that's right exactly and yes. you know and if our generation is feeling it and the weight of it i don't want to even ima- well we need to imagine what this young generation are going through and the burden that they are carrying. So, you know, we, uh, I'm more recently, actually last week, I had a Zoom meeting with the freshman class of fall and the new students that were admitted this spring. And these are students who we have not yet physically met. Yes. And um, one of the things that I had, you know, shared with our executive vice president, our vice president was, you know, I miss seeing these new students because, as you know, two and a half thousand students, I mean, it's two and a half thousand yeah. students, but we know them by name. Yes, we bump right. into yeah. them on a daily basis. We see them in classes. Our campus is an urban campus. We see them everywhere. They stay uh, on yeah. campus, whether whether they're taking classes or not. They, we engage them on a daily basis. We don't have that. So I wanted to see them. I wanted to see them. I wanted to see the name. I wanted to see the face. I wanted to hear their voices. And so I did. And the question that was raised that uh, as a matter of is sort of the internal question is what is it going to look like when do we have to relearn what it means to be back on campus? Yeah, that's a good question. And what does that mean? How ready are we? And do we need to have a readiness plan? Mm. And what is that readiness plan going to look like? Is it going to be smaller classes? Is it different kind of engagement of students? Is it to, do we have to relearn how to be in physical proximity with each other? Yes. Yeah. The way in which we greet each other. And, you know, and the funny thing about it is also with the notion of anxiety being 
your regular socializing with people and feeling a, a level of discomfort because you cannot carry on a conversation because you've gotten so used to talking over Zoom, all right? Yes. But then I've also heard the other side of it in that we've had so many Zoom meetings with, with each other and colleagues where, you know, virtual meetings where you become, you know, exhausted. They're called it Zoom exhaustion. But the fact that you're doing it electronically or virtually, it takes away from the conversation one way or another when you're continuously looking at yourself with other people yeah. or like electronically. You know, there is that, I, I'm not quite sure how to express this, but there is this sort of, it's funny when you don't have it, you notice it, but you have it, you don't think about it. I call it the sort of soulfulness of the conversation. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was just telling Mahdi the, uh, last week, there was an article in... Uh, from Stanford, which I'll do a podcast, Mahdi and I, and talk about it. But the author kind of recognized four uh, variables of why this is Zoom, a toxic, toxic call. I don't know, he called it like overindulging in Zoom. And why are we exhausted when we're, you know, because I was like, I always wonder, like, I usually I talk all day. I, you know, I talk a lot anyways. Why is it that when I'm doing my Zoom classes or I see everyone on Zoom, by the end of the day, I feel so exhausted and so anyways, there was a few, several variables uh, that this author talked about. But one of them he was mentioning, which I thought was interesting, which is something what you're saying is that when we have conversation, like when you and I are talking or when we're talking in real life, I don't have to see my face. Neither do you have to see your face. So that's right. But seeing our face, which, you know, the author was, was giving us uh, some hint of what you can actually turn your face out. They can see you, but you don't have to see your face. But I never really re realized how like, looking at my own self could be another reason why I'm exhausted because I'm constantly, you know, you're looking at yourself, you're criticizing, am I speaking okay? Am I not? like having this mirror reflection 24 hours that you're walking or talking or whatever, which we don't do in real life. So that's and one I, of the yeah. reasons why we're exhausted. Yeah. And uh, I think that the notion of active listening, all right, uh, the, yeah. um, it requires, I think, a presence and you and conversations are not just simply verbal; they're also nonverbal. And so, you know, your being or your presence is an important part of the conversation or the dialogue or the discussion. And it's missing, yes. So that I go to campus and I do meet people. You know, obviously, you know, abiding by the social distancing rules and all the various precautionary measures that we take, but. A lot of my colleagues have said, you know, it is so good to be actually sitting in an office and being able to physically engage in conversation. The presence gives it a completely entirely different meaning, um, whereas, you know, some of these Zoom conversations can be so subject to different nuances and misinterpretations or different interpretations than what it is originally intended to be. So, I've heard a lot, but what it tells me is that ultimately we are social beings, aren't we? And so, yeah. you know, the notion of being together, physically together as a community is exceptionally important. Someone said, you know, more recently, so what do you think of online education? I said, well, it may work for some who who want to take classes at a distance. It's very convenient. Certainly some courses can be done and operated that way. But for our institution, you know, what makes our institution so unique is actually the presence of people. Yes. Um, yeah. And, but, you know, to be honest, I think we should have half-half, you know. Mm -hmm. I think there are, because there are a lot of, also some of our students are working. So yes. I think you're having them rush to class or they can only take afternoon classes or evening classes because they can't, you know, like what we call them student at large or evening student. We do have students. I mean, you know, to our listeners' surprise, we have students that are working. There are parents and maybe, maybe this will help them. I think this, if we can have a, a combination, an opportunity to offer yeah. both ways instead of like, you know, having one way or the other. This would really help. It can be convenient for individuals that have to stay home with their kids or and not making it all virtual, but I think we should have a mix now that we've had been trained and, and the students yes. know what to do. Yeah, I don't think there is, you know, the I think for all post secondary institutions, there is no such thing as going back to anything. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> I think yeah. that that I mean if it had happened for two or three weeks or for a month, yes, you can talk about going back. 
to anything. At this point in time, we need to evolve, all right? What that means strategically, you know, we need to think about. So, you know, you're talking about blended learning environments, absolutely. This is not something that, this is something that we have to consider and need to consider. There is an efficiency and effectiveness in student engagement on, you know, virtual student engagement is very important, as well as physical student engagement. We have the technology and we are strategizing on how to improve upon that technology and digitalization yeah. and transformation. And so, you know, we're going to capitalize on that. Yes? Yeah, I think and, it's a good idea. Um, yeah, exactly. I don't think so, should, but I don't does, really think, I think we've trained, I think we've taught our students how to be resilient and how to be able to manage to be independent. Because, you know, when you're virtual, they got to do a lot more independence. They have to read a lot more on their own. And I think we've taught them a skill. I don't think that we should forfeit, but just because now we could go back to normal, whatever that normal is. Whatever that new normal is. Yeah, exactly. I think, I think that... Capitalize on it. Yeah. I think that, you know, online instruction, at least the way in which we did it, was uh, much more intense yeah. and uh, required a tremendous amount of effort on, on both sides. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, a level of independence uh, on the part of the students. Uh, they quickly had to learn. It's easier to sort of be able to sit in faculty offices and, you know, have that conversation and re-explanation and so on and so forth. It is now, you know, efficiency is the sort of norm. And so everybody had to re-educate themselves um, in terms of how that gets done. So uh, I don't foresee us going back to the way in which things were, and we shouldn't. I think we need to capitalize on our technology, on, uh, on our new experiences, and just simply go from there. Absolutely. Yeah. I know you're both educators, and I, I totally understand that. But being a parent and not an educator and having a six-year-old son who is literally missing out on the foundational pieces of his, his life and his development. I think, Dr. D, I learned in one of your classes that the most malleable a child is is from the age of four to about nine or ten, and that's when they pick up a lot of skills like language skills and everything. And right now, I mean, as a parent, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at this from two perspectives. One, DJ is definitely not getting the social interaction that he needs as, as a six-year-old. And he's missing out on that foundational piece. And I think that's the most important piece of education in school is having peers, learning from others in sports is a big part of that, too. And Dr. Roll, the AUK, has always had a great sports program, too. And I think that's an integral piece to creating a well-rounded student. And the second part is the financial piece. As a parent, I'm looking at this saying, okay, you know, I'm paying pretty much the same fees that I was paying pre-COVID. And I'm not getting the actual benefit. Now, it's different for a college student because they are more mature and everything. But for the younger students, for the younger kids, it's life going back to normal is, in my opinion, as a parent, so important for these kids because I can't imagine a world with kids growing up with teachers on a computer. It's just so impersonable. And I think it's going to lead to a lot of societal issues that we're going to face later. And we still don't know what the aftermath in 10 years is going to be for most of these kids. Yeah. So what are your thoughts? What are both of your thoughts as educators? Because it's easy for me to sit here and complain as a parent versus you, the educators, who have to set up these systems so that kids and you know uh, college students do get the best education possible. I have grandchildren, and the grandchildren are pretty much eight. Well, actually, the oldest one is seven, four, and two. And the seven-year-old, and my daughter had is expressing exactly the same sentiment, and I'm hearing it all over as a matter of fact, that she feels that her daughters are missing out on the social interaction that was so important and critical when sending them to school maybe preschool or first or second or third grade, she feels, I mean, I'm just simply going to quote her. She says, I feel so sorry for my children that they're missing out on all the notion of being with friends, with sleepovers, going out to the playground without having to think that they may be touching things that may harm them or bring harm to others in the household. Yes. 
and the kind of going back to school movement i think is the uh, is a motivator for you know please normalize the lives of our children uh, in a sense that you know they can grow up you know emotionally and socially well adjusted especially during these formative years i cannot imagine uh, what the consequences of this is but i do know that Dr. Julia, do you, I mean, in your particular field, I think psychologists and psychiatrists and counselors are all grappling with the idea, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out, you know, what next? How do you, how do you deal with some of these, you know, suddenly overnight, you know, students or kids who are not permitted to go back to school? And they pretty much had to learn how to operate and how to socialize online. And what does that mean? So, Mahdi, I, I, although, you know, you, you, you tell me that I'm an educator. I am also at a loss in terms of what that would mean for us in the future and what we need to do as educators to sort of pick up the pieces and move forward. But there is one thing that I do know. We need to quickly adapt, change, and figure something out. In other words, you know, time is not on our side because, you know, as the year passes, you know, things need to be put in place when children come back to school, uh, you know, how are you going to deal with some of the trauma that these children went through? How do you re-socialize them? How do you teach them how to be with friends and peers? Something that we had taken for granted in the past, that this comes sort of happens naturally as you school children and they play with their neighbor children and, and they engage other children, whether on the playground or in sports events or ballet classes or football classes or soccer classes or art classes that it hasn't happened for a year what does that mean so dr I, juliet you know you're you, right I, I do think i mean you're right and you know you guys and even you mahdi with dj it's true he, he has missed out a whole year and he hasn't had a lot of opportunity and we have to be ready to really kind of embrace that there he's gonna have a lot more anxiety when he goes and i think there is a lot of there's a lot of research that says, and we know that kids have become more depressed. They've become more suicidal being at home. They feel isolated. Their anxiety is increasing. And I see that, you know, in my clinical work. And, and I also can see it with my students when they're talking about how anxious they've been, or they've been sick, or they've been missing out in classes. And I know, and this is the fact of life. How are we going to make, you know, DJ is never going to make up all the this year that he has missed out, but we're hoping that through time and through the right support that we can give our kids or our students the ability to be able to immerse themselves. I mean, think about it. You know, this is not the first time we've had crisis and this is not the first time some of our students have had a crisis in their life. It was difficult at first and then they manage. And we have to teach our kids that this is also, this shall pass, that we need to be able to help them talk about it and be able to immerse them back into the real world when that happens or whatever that happens. We need to prepare them. We need to listen to them and we need to recognize that this is happening globally and they're not isolated in the way they feel. So DJ is going to go back and he's going to work and he's going to play and he's going to make friends. And But at what capacity is he going to go back? I mean, th- there's been talk surfacing in the last few days that Kids aren't going back to school next year in September. It's probably going to be in the second term. And I immediately looked at Haya this morning and I said to her, if this is the case, you guys need to go stay in a country where there is schooling for the year because, you know, we value education. Yeah. And to not have a system in place and to say, okay, we're still going to do this online. I mean, look, let's be realistic for a six year old. Versus an 18 or 20 yeah. year old, yeah. you know, it's, it's, very it's difficult. extremely you're difficult right. for the child. I'm hoping that what you're saying is not uh, true and it's only a uh, rumor. If but- it's true, I mean, hey, and DJ, I already told her, you guys are moving to Dubai or somewhere that values education and he can go to school. He needs it. You know, it's. And actually, to be honest, I've had several people that I know also have gone, have left, have gone to Dubai. I mean, I sent my son to the US, you know, you know, and it's not like I really was like, wanted to do this, but I felt like for him, him sitting here and being able to just do virtual and, and he was being distracted and he wasn't getting into any kind of activities. There's not no friends coming over. And just that three, four months at the beginning when this happened, he was starting to get so anxious that I'm like, no, you're going to the US. You got to go somewhere where you could have at least, I mean, in his schooling, he has that, you know, what are they called? The hybrid 
where he goes to school, sometimes virtual, sometimes, and it's working wonderful for him. I'd hate for you to do that with DJ and Haya, but you're right. I mean, sometimes like with your six-year-old, you're not going to be, but now not everyone has that ability and the opportunity to do that. So what should we do? That, that's very true. I have one more question for you and Dr. Rola. Uh, this just came up and I don't want to forget it. Sorry, Dr. Dinka. Dr. Rola, Dr. D. With the changes that you guys are describing that may take place in the educational system, especially at higher education from the college level, which, you know, I think, I think people at that age should be responsible enough to adhere to. But do you guys see advancements in the curriculum and changes in the curriculums that have been taught over the last few years into maybe something more comprehensive and diverse, um, maybe to challenge students a little bit more because they're not getting stimulated within the classroom and the discussions that took place? I mean, Dr. Rolda, I took a class with you where we had to reenact a court case. And I think that was extremely. I know he's dying to tell oh, yeah, you. Yeah. I, was, I was waiting for the perfect he's segue. Been dying. And I wanted to get into that quickly before we end. I want you to talk about it, Randy. You're dying to say Oh, yeah. This. It's, I mean, it was the perfect uh, character builder for a lot of us students. Me and Haya were in that class. Haya was the, she was the defense attorney. Both attorneys are both lawyers left crying in different specific moments in the class. It was a very emotional class. People took their roles seriously. But Dr. Rolda, don't you think we're going to be robbed of experiences like that? And if we are robbed of experiences like that, how do you think the education system will be able to flip it around so that students get something different as of the same value for their characters and development? Well, online, this is, I mean, role playing, you can do this uh, online and offline. Yes, that's what we did. So, you know, we, we engaged the class in sort of, a, you know, role playing mode and uh, whether we can do it virtually or on the ground, it's probably will have the similar kind of learning moments, uh, similar, not the same, but certainly similar. But let me address the question that you just raised. Is the curriculum going to change? It's going to have to change. All right. The fact of the matter is that uh, in the post-pandemic world, we are going to be confronted with an entire different world, uh, both on the level of the social dynamics, the social relations, the economic situation, and also the socio the socio political situations. Yes, there needs to be much more attention placed on what does it mean to to initiate progress and change in order to avoid exactly the situation that we find ourselves in, yes, where the world can come together and think together. Research needs to take a different mode altogether. Education, we need to, you know, we need to engage our students in a sort of education whereby when they leave any institute, whether AUP or otherwise, they can actually affect positive change, yes. The world cannot remain where it is. It needs to be uh, ahead of its game. And uh, so, yes, it's going to, uh, of course, impact the way in which the content, the substance of our curriculum and uh, the usefulness of our curriculum. So, yes. I mean, we uh, have to I, be I creative, to be yes. honest. Yes. Just you, like we became creative being that's virtual right. and we had to change. I mean, you know, I, I, mean, I don't know about my... Uh, other my colleagues, but I know that we probably all had changed the way we teach. I had to change the way, you know, my slides, the way I present certain things I had to accommodate. And I think if that's what's going to happen, we're going to have to change the curriculum. We have to meet the need of our students. And if that requires, you know, I don't really think that you can do role playing. We, you know, in social psychology, we talk about Zimbardo prison experiment and we talk about all these like experiments that we know sometimes we enact and they do presentation and we'll do the best we can. I mean, I know, Mehdi, this is not the answer that you maybe were looking or, or uh, how can we get DJ to be, a, to adopt? How can I get Larson to get, you know, adopting? I just think that maybe this is not, you know, the answer for all, but I think this is, go it's going to make DJ a stronger person. He's going to remember that he, in time of his life, there was a pandemic and this is how we survived. Just like kids that have grown in wars. And kids are grown in, in poverty lands and, you know, they develop something that makes them, you're never going to make up for those developmental years, but you are going to be able to learn that there's something that's going to come good out of it. And that's how I, I look at it. I, I know it's hard and I know that we all don't want to live the way we're living. And if we have to stay another semester, I don't know what I'll do with myself. I think I'm going to cry in Dr. Rauda's office every day, but 
can I manage? Yeah. Can my student manage? Yes. But we just need to have support. DJ. Yeah. And I think that honesty is the best policy. I mean, you know, I think parents were forced, they have experiences where parents become very honest with their children and try to explain to them what is happening and why it is happening. And it appears that the children are actually more resilient than than we give them credit. Yeah, they they appear true. to understand that. But I think that it is an experience that they will go through. They've sort of termed this generation, generation C. I hate myself. I'm not very keen on you know giving generations uh, you know different sort of acronyms and terminologies. But so um, you know, people are thinking about you know what to do next. And there's a lot of research that's coming out in terms of how we need to behave. But I. Th- I think that for the time being is that honesty is the best policy with our children. Explain to them what we're going through, why we're doing what we're doing, and that things will get better. And, you know, being the eternal romantic, yeah, exactly. you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And you know what? And, you know, when it's okay to tell parents that, you know, I, I'm, I don't have a problem telling my kids, look, I don't know either. And yes, I'm anxious. And yes, I'm vulnerable. And I mean, I think sometimes like with parents that I work with, it's like they don't want to look like they're weak or vulnerable in front of their kids, that they want to have the right answers. And that's not the way to do it right now. That doesn't work. Just admit that you're anxious. Admit that I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but we'll figure it out. I mean, that's something I say all the time. And I tell you, teach people, you'll figure it out. You're not going to figure it out now, but you will figure it out. And that's the way. That's what families there. And academically, you know, this is why we have, you know, teams and we have supportive administrations. And so that way, you know, everyone knows that we're all going through the same thing. This is what's good about it. The one thing I find to, to be good is that doesn't matter what country you live in, they're all experiencing similar psychological and physical symptoms. And for me, that's in a way that helps me recognize, okay, well, I'm not isolated. So we don't have the answer for DJ, but I'm more than willing to babysit him if you ever want that. <laughs> I'd appreciate that. I'd... No, but, but <laughs> we'll take him to Dr. Rhoda's house. Yeah, but you know something, Mahdi, you know, let's also place it within context. Okay, this is a pandemic that everybody is feeling, but under ordinary circumstances, I mean, let me give you, you know, a a comparison. On a daily basis, 20,000 children die of hunger Mm. on a daily basis. 100%. Now, you know, we don't talk much about, but that is a huge number, right? They die of hunger. And so, the general public doesn't feel it. We don't have a conversation about it, but that is all absolutely, you know, it's a global tragedy that, you know, in the 21st century, we're still dealing with something like that. So, you know, in contrast, you know, we are doing okay. Some people are doing better than others. And, you know, in one way or another, you know, we we hold on to the notion that uh, we, you know, we are okay. We, we, we count our yeah. blessings. And I think that, you know, appreciating what we have at the moment and then sort of moving forward may be also a good way of, you know, setting it within context uh, so that we don't get overly depressed about our own situation that we find ourselves in, you know, relatively speaking to other people's problems and issues and other countries' issues. I mean, imagine my, imagine my place. I have to hear my students being anxious and then I have to hear my clients being anxious and I'm anxious. So can you imagine what my world looks like? <laughs> well, look, you guys got to come out to Waffle for a barbecue one day. When oh, yeah. And I agree with you, Dr. Rolda. <laughs> like, I thank God every day that we do have certain privileges that most don't have. Yeah. You know, I thank God that, you know, I had started building my house three or four years ago. And, you know, I it was dumb luck that I, you know, I was able to get land and, you know, loans and everything that the government provided. And the first lockdown happened, I looked at Hay and I said, we need to get another loan and finish this house because if another lockdown happens, I want to have the space in, you know, in Wafra, which is pretty much the middle of the desert, to have some freedom. And out here, unlike you guys in the city, I mean, I can go outside at, you know, six, seven o'clock at night and go for a walk in my neighborhood. Yeah, There's not a person to be seen for miles. And, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that my son can go outside and play in the sand, ride his bike in the street and do these things right now because, you know, unfortunately, we are in a global pandemic. People aren't out as much. Things aren't getting done. Yeah, and you're discovering new abilities that you have. So, for you know, more recently, I was you know leafing through you know how to make sourdough bread. I certainly, <laughs> under ordinary circumstances, would be of, of no interest to me whatsoever. 
Yes, <laughs> you know, you, you're trying. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're discover we discovering our ourselves now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's really true. Hundred sure. percent, and I and that's the beauty of it. Like, and I, you know, some people look at this as a troubling time. I look at this at a time where I want DJ to look back and say, I had a lot of time with my dad. I yeah, had a great time see? with him. See? You know, we wake up that's together, right. we that's eat right. breakfast together, we walk the dog together. Right. He works out with me. Yep. You know, and and Doctor D, you'd be proud of this. Before I'd work out, I get in my zone, and I would see DJ, Heya, my mother, everybody that's around as an annoyance, whereas now I'm starting to embrace it mm-hmm. and, you know, getting my son to work out with me. And, you know, it's fun. And I'm I'm happy that he's going to remember this time. Yep. And it's going to overshadow the bad parts of it. So Exactly. And that's what I was saying is that there are some things that we've given us quality time with our kids or it has definitely for me, it made me stop a little bit and don't have to like, run around and do this and do that. And life has a different perspective and I don't have to worry about anything and I don't have the answers for anything and it's okay. While before I felt like, no, 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 I got to say this the right thing. I got to do this. I, I don't. I'm just like, okay, whatever. Things will work out. And I truly believe that. So Yeah, and things will get better. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> things will, you know, it, it, we, we always come out of these situations, you know, stronger, hopefully, and better. And I th- and I hope, I hope, though, you know, history always has a way of repeating itself, but you know, that this time around that humanity understands that that cannot be repeated. So, you know, uh, pre-crisis management prevention rather than, you know, is better than an ounce of cure. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. hopefully we've learned our lesson. Yes, hopefully. That's true. Inshallah. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Roda. Thank you. It was for great. Us a lot of your time. You. We, thank uh, you. Thank you again, and it was lovely uh, speaking to you, and it was lovely seeing you, Mahdi, and I wish you all the best. I know, 100%. I, I, I can't wait to come and uh, visit you once things cool down at the office, inshallah, sometime soon. Inshallah. I'll definitely bring DJ. You know, I'm sure you and Dr. D remember me and Haya walking around campus as two <laughs> young students. <laughs> and who would have thought that we would have gotten married, you know, right after college and, you know, still be together with, you know, a beautiful young six-year-old yeah. right now. <laughs> he's, he's gorgeous. Dr. Rauda, you have to see DJ. He's Hopefully gorgeous. he'll be roaming around the corridors of AUK someday. <laughs> yes, hopefully. And will certainly make us feel our age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rauda. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Juliet. Thank you very much, Mehdi. And my regards to your family. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. You can also find us on Instagram at The Project Thank You. And join us next time.